Um, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for being here. I'm Jamie Allen Black, the Executive Director of the Jewish Women's Foundation of New York. And on behalf of the foundation and our partners, Martin Kaminer and the Good People Fund, we welcome you to Me Too from the Pulpit, a rabbi's role in creating safe and respectful synagogue communities. Uh, this is not a full training. We'll cover topics including best practices for fostering an environment where all staff and congregants feel safe and respected, uh, boundaries, yours and your congregants and your um, and everyone, relations between congregants, when to be restorative and when not to be, and then respond to your interests and your questions. We try to make sure we're gonna pack a lot into this hour, but we wanna make sure there's time for you as well. Our presenters today are Fran Seppler and, Rachel, and Rabbi Rachel Ain. Rabbi Rachel Ain is the rabbi of Sutton Place Synagogue in Manhattan. And she has generously agreed to co-facilitate this webinar with Fran Seppler, who is the president of Seppler and Associates, Associates, which provide services and advice to organizations interested in creating the most respectful workplaces possible. And we are grateful to both of them for their time and their expertise and i think you're going to get a lot out of this um, webinar and there's probably a lot more to come in the future so thank you very much turning it over okay so welcome everybody thank you for taking the time for being on this webinar i want to go over why we're here what we're going to do today and how we're gonna get there. So first of all, why are we here? Well, we know over the past year, um, and for many years before that, but certainly the past year, um, the issue of Me Too has sprung up. Um, it sprung up loudly and clearly across all institutions, political, entertainment, clergy, and more. And with this coming weekend being the anniversary of the Women's March, and the Me Too women getting the time people of the year, this issue is something that we know we need to explore. We know it's complicated and that there is not a one size fits all. In fact, this past weekend in particular, there have been numerous op-eds and articles and exposés around a whole variety of issues, which makes us wonder, are we lumping too many different things together? Are we trying to fit a uh, round peg into a square hole when that doesn't always work. And then we're concerned about the backlash if we try to do that too much. So practically speaking, what are we thinking about? What are we speaking about? What is our role as rabbis? What are some of the thorny issues we need to talk about? What is my role? So first, just a little about me. Um, as Jamie said, I'm a congregational rabbi. I've been one for almost 14 years at a conservative synagogue. Um, I've been in, at Sutton Place Synagogue for almost six years. I think the questions that are arising today are questions such as, who owns this conversation? Is it a conversation that only women should be having? If you look on your social media feeds, it can also often be that as people start having this conversation, if men start to wade into the conversation, one might wonder, is there a role? I, my bias is right out there. I think the answer is yes, men should be a part of this conversation. Um, who is the rabbi supposed to be looking out for during, as in his or her role? Is it looking out for themselves, their congregants, the staff? Of course, it's everybody, but how do we do that simultaneously? Um, I will admit I am not an expert, so here I am already diminishing myself, which I think is an issue that women put themselves in sometimes, um, often by others, but sometimes by themselves. What does it mean for a rabbi to be an expert on an issue such as this, which is so complicated? Um, but what I'm hoping the role I can play in this webinar is framing the conversation, um, thinking about some of the different issues that we've seen, and then Fran will take us from there. So here's what we're gonna do today. First, I'm gonna tell you what we're not gonna be focusing on. Then we're gonna talk about what we will be focusing on. In fact, many of the ideas generated from the questions that you sent in. Um, over 100 people registered for this conference, which means, and there were probably at least 50 questions. There's no way we're gonna to get to all of them. Then we're gonna think about some of the categories that those questions were asked in. 
from there, we will um, head to definitions and best practices. It's important. I think actually the most important part of this webinar is nothing that I say, but what Fran says, helping us take over um, what we're going to be doing. We'll look at a case study, and then we'll go to questions from, from you from the field. If questions arise throughout, if they're clarifying questions, put them in the chat. If they're not clarifying questions, put them in the chat. We'll do our best to get to them. If we don't get to all of them, um, which we probably won't, we'll find a way to follow up at the end. So let's start. Um, what won't we be focusing on today? We are not going to be focusing on abuse of children. Um, abuse of children is categorically something that needs to be dealt with sexual abuse, um, child abuse. Um, there are so many areas that we need to talk about. We do not have the scope to address issues of um, abuse of kids at this moment. Um, that's a webinar that we should do in and of itself. Same thing with domestic violence and reporting. Um, Fran and I had a discussion, should we bring in someone whose expertise is on the issue of DV. This is also a huge issue that should not be ignored. Rabbis should get training on it. I myself have been involved with Jewish Women International. That's something that you should get involved with. There is not enough time on this webinar. Um, and the last thing that we're not gonna be spoke, speaking about specifically is what does it mean to train men? Uh, that question came up numerous times in the, in the registration form. Um, it will come up as how do we think about the different categories of people who are affected, but we're not going to spend a lot of time talking about training men. Um, so here, what will we be focusing on? There were four major areas of questions that were sent in. The first is conflict towards employees, often female rabbis, by congregants. Um, and what is the issue that female rabbis feel by congregants? The second issue is the conflict towards congregants by employees. What happens when rabbis and other professional staff or um, any staff in the synagogue does something to make a congregant uncomfortable? The third is issues between congregants themselves. Um, and the fourth is issues between staff, um, whether that's where there is a power dynamic, senior rabbi to junior rabbi, um, and so on. Now, within that, as we know, there's not only categories of people, but there's context of problems. There's issues of harassment. There's issues of abuse. There's blatant sexism. And then there's flirting. And why is this distinction important? Because in our response, in forming alliances, in wondering how do we speak up and with whom do we speak up, we need to do so in a way that people will listen. And if we speak in a way where all of these things are put into one bucket, we might be less effective in communicating. So that's why soon enough we'll get to Fran who will give us these definitions and best practices. There were some other questions that emerged including how do we prepare for this as we're entering the rabbinate? There are um, people on this call who are earlier in their career um, and wondering what should we be doing in school? Um, how do we do that? We know that the rabbinical schools are starting to think about these issues. I remember I graduated from JTS in 2004. Even before, so during my time in school, we had a mini master on issues of sexual harassment. So things have been raised, but we can always better the schools are working on this. And I hope that as a follow up to this webinar, we'll be able to share some best practices of trainings that are currently going on. The uh, second issue, and I touched on this a bit, is what is the difference between compliments and harassment? Um, how do we deal with that? Um, and third, how do we report when there is a problem? Meaning, how do we report if somebody tells us and they want us to do something? Or how do, they how do we report if somebody comes to us and asks us to keep it in confidence? What is our role knowing clergy confidentiality? Um, like I said before, the most common question asked was how do women clergy respond if something unwanted happened towards them as a, by a congregant or a senior staff member? Um, and within that, there was the range of harassment and sexism. So that's the overview of some of the issues. Um, I'm now going to turn it over to Fran. One. 
I'm going to spend some time just talking about definitions. And before I do that, um, I want to urge you to both keep in mind that these are legal constructs and understanding where they sit in the law is really important. But the law is far less important than your organization's policy because that is really the working day-to-day -day manual about what you expect from people. And your policy is a little less important than your culture, which really sends the implicit messages about what your values are and how you want people treated. With that being said, let me parse apart a couple of things that have been sort of put in a blender together and, um, and, and separate them out for the purposes of our discussion. Um, by the way, I have, uh, I will tell you these slides will be made available to you and this is being recorded and that recording will be available as well. So if you feel you need to furiously write notes, you can relax. So the first thing I want to talk about is sexual assault. Sexual assault is a crime. Um, and that's an important way to frame it up because it means that there's no such thing as any sexual assault that is okay. Sexual assault is defined as non-consensual contact, penetration, or exposure. And there are some technical things according to each state's laws in terms of things like age differential or degrees to which uh, one is guilty of sexual assault. For instance, minor touching, uh, not touching of a minor, but uh, simple touching of somebody's buttocks uh, in a non-assaulted way would be viewed very differently from forcible rape. But the fact is these are all criminal. And when we're talking about something being a crime, it means that society has as a whole decided that this behavior is worth taking away somebody's liberty for and a public prosecutor will pursue it. It is a matter of public safety and a matter of public policy. And the solution to sexual assault is obviously very clearly um, that it is a criminal offense and must be treated as such. Can we move to the next slide, please? Now, a lot of the behavior we're hearing about these days involves unlawful harassment. Unlawful harassment is part of civil rights law. It is a basic protection for people who are members of protected classes, whether that be uh, uh, somebody who's a member of a racial group or a national origin or religion, uh, and certainly gender. Um, the idea being that each person should have equal opportunity to enter into and to compete in the American workplace. And so civil rights laws say that you can't be discriminated against in hiring or pay or promotion. And as that law developed in the 1970s and 1980s, it expanded to say, if we get away with, if we get do away with these structural forms of discrimination, but somebody comes into the workplace and they are treated so badly, so differently, so brutally uh, in, in ways that invoke fear or discomfort or, uh, or trauma, uh, then that really is functionally discriminating against them as well. It keeps them from being able to participate in the marketplace. So harassment was added to a violation of civil rights as was retaliating against somebody for complaining about harassment. Now, from the standpoint of the law, if you are harassed in your workplace or your school, the remedy is to report it to your employer. With the exception of one very severe type of sexual harassment, previously known as quid pro quo, this would be somebody uh, being told that they have to perform sexual acts to get their job or keep their job, or that if they don't perform sexual acts, they'll be fired. It's now called tangible harm sexual harassment. And in that case, there's what we call strict liability. If it happens, your organization is in very serious trouble. But the most common kind of harassment is what we call hostile environment, and I'll explain that in just a moment. But if you experience a hostile environment based on your gender in the workplace, you report it to your employer. Your employer is obligated to stop it, regardless of whether the person who's harassing you is a vendor, a supplier, uh, another employee, a supervisor, uh, and in your cases, a congregant or a guest speaker. The obligation of the employer is to provide employees with a workplace free of harassment. When they come to you and complain, your duty is to figure out what's going on, and if this is happening, stop it. The happy news is 
that if you have a good policy, if you do good training, if you respond effectively to a complaint of harassment and it stops, you are not legally liable. So unlike sexual assault, which is a crime and a hard stop, sexual harassment becomes a legal problem when it rises to a very high level when it's reported to the employer and the employer fails to address it. The elements that have to be proven to prevail in court are that the behavior was unwelcome, you didn't invite it, you didn't reciprocate it, you didn't enjoy it. That does not mean you objected to it. We know that based on the power structure of these things that sometimes people can't speak up and even go along. But one has to be persuaded that the behavior was unwelcome. It must be pervasive or severe. A simple brutish comment or a, a, a bit of sexism um, does not, uh, does not constitute per pervasive or severe sexual harassment. As I'll say in a moment, that doesn't mean it's okay or it should be accepted, but it certainly doesn't cross the line into unlawful behavior. Pervasive means that it saturates the environment. It's happening day in, day out um, in, 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 um, in many different ways. Severe means outrageous. Uh, Incidents we've read about recently with a person in a position of authority exposing their genitals to an employee, we would certainly not say, well, let's see if that happens again. That would rise to the level where it was severe enough uh, to be considered harassment. Offensive to a reasonable person, and the full sentence there should be offensive to a reasonable person similarly situated. So if I'm a 40-year-old woman, it is offensive to a reasonable 40-year-old woman. If I am a 17-year-old uh, 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 worker in your childcare uh, program, it would be offensive to a reasonable 17-year-old. And one might argue that those two things can't exist side by side, but uh, uh, I think you get the point. And then, obviously, it has to be sexual or gender-based, and it rises to the level where it interferes with the terms and conditions of employment. Simple to say, that when the courts look at these things, they set a very high bar. Prevailing in these kinds of claims usually requires a terrible fact situation. Next slide, please. The third category I wanna talk about is misconduct. Um, misconduct is behavior that violates your policy. And this is where culture and policy come in. Your organization should never set the bar simply to say we prohibit unlawful behavior. It should affirmatively tell your people what it is you expect. And when I say people, I'm talking about all employees. Um, and to the extent that you have policies that you share with individuals who attend your events, people who partake of your services, they can, um, can be governed by a policy. And you can have a code of conduct that is developed by and shared amongst your own congregation where the expectations of behavioral standards can be applied. Of course, the enforceability of these applies primarily to employees and guests. Um, congregations have to be self-policing with regards to the rest of that. I'm going to take just a moment here. Um, and talk about something that, that Rachel mentioned earlier, Rabbi Ian mentioned earlier, and that I think is important. Um, generally, Fran, yes? Before you go into that, there are a few clarifying questions that I just want sure. to, you to answer. The, do these legal yeah. categories, do you see them? Uh, I don't. They're in the chat. Okay. Do these legal categories okay. apply in all settings? including religious and all states, and who is considered the, uh, the employer in the synagogue. Okay, so uh, these legal, legal categories do apply in all states. This is based on federal law. Um, and uh, so certain states have greater protections than others, but all states are bound by the federal law prohibiting sexual harassment and defining the standard for liability. And then as far as who is considered the employer in synagogues, the synagogue itself is the employer if it has employees. Um, so so um, these are things that apply to employment situations where the synagogue is the employer. They don't apply to other kinds of relationships. Thank you. Sure. So one of the things I want to make sure that you're all aware of is that um, when an employee comes to you and says, I want to tell you something that's happened to me and I don't want you to do anything about it. Um, generally, 
if you are considered an agent of your employer, you are considered to be a supervisor or manager, uh, you are not in a position to grant that request. The standard for liability is that you knew or should have known harassment was happening and you fail to act on it. So I think it's, I think, and I am not either a rabbi or an expert on religious institutions, but I think that as rabbis, the toughest situation you face is when someone comes to you and makes that request. If you are considered structurally a manager or supervisor and they are coming to you in that regard, you cannot maintain confidentiality. On the other hand, if they are coming to you uh, with, for a, a conversation protected by your ministerial privilege and they are seeking counseling, uh, you have another decision to make. And I think in those situations, it is important to be very well advised about, uh, about what the difference is between those conversations when you have an obligation to act and when you do not. If we could move on to the next slide. So my approach to working with organizations is to always start from the assumption that your best protection against harassment is insisting upon modeling and promoting a respectful environment. Uh, and what we know is that respectful behavior doesn't necessarily come naturally to people. They have to talk about it. We have to share our understanding of what that is. And I think it's also important to recognize that research is starting to give us a pretty persuasive picture that disrespectful, uncivil, or rude behavior most things, most of these being things that we are never going to have a policy prohibiting because of, you, you would never communicate, uh, but that this kind of behavior is actually sort of a gateway drug for gendered, uh, gendered harassment and gendered hostility in the workplace. So that if people are allowed to be disrespectful or uncivil or rude, it creates a much more hospitable environment to the much more explicitly offensive and problematic behavior in the workplace. The two specific behaviors that are problem most problematic in the workplace and should be addressed in your policy are abusive behavior, which is basically harassing people for no reason or any reason, being a bully, and of course, harassing behavior up to and including unlawful harassing behavior. Then at the end of the continuum, of course, we get into uh, criminal behavior. Next slide, please. Many of you had questions about policies. Unfortunately, we don't have enough time today to do everything I'd love to do in talking to you about policies, but the essential components of a policy would be to set an expectation. What is it we want in terms of behavior from people? Then, what are the things that are not acceptable in this organization, and what will happen to you if you do it? We want to provide people who may be the targets of this behavior options for addressing it, you always want to give them permission to object, but you may never require that they do so. And you also want to give them the option of reporting anonymously or identifying themselves. Finally, what is the process when somebody complains? What will happen? And one of the things that need to be explained is that investigations cannot be done completely confidentially. Often you will have to share the identity of somebody who's brought a complaint forward. Um, and, and that may mean working through with them, their worries about that. And then finally, a prohibition against retaliation. Next slide, please. And so to wrap up this portion, um, we talk about the constellations of misconduct within a synagogue. And what we see is that um, when you have an employee involved, whether it is with another employee, or whether it's a guest or vendor or speaker or a congregant, your obligations are the same. These are things happening in their workspace and the organization, the synagogue itself, has an obligation to provide every employee a workplace free from harassment and hopefully a workplace filled with respect. Uh, the congregant to congregant world is one that is, um, is up to the synagogue and usually those sorts of codes of conduct or expectations are developed by the congregants themselves, by lay leadership. One more slide, please. Finally, I want to talk about a way to talk about uh, organizational culture that is preventative. 
there are three fundamental and essential things that are necessary to prevent, uh, prevent harassment in any kind of organization. Number one is people have to feel emotionally, psychologically, and physically safe. That means that they are, it is safe for them to speak up when something happens. It is safe to seek help, uh, that the expectation is that they will be safe and anything that makes them feel unsafe should trigger for them a sense of surprise and an action plan. Secondly, respect. Respect shows up not just in the daily small bits of behavior uh, we engage in and a uh, desire to be free of everything from microaggressions up to harassment, but it is being respectful enough to provide feedback to one another and to take the feedback in the spirit of continually improving relationships and conduct and the climate. And finally, fairness. In this day of Me Too, there is, has been a tendency to jump to conclusions about what uh, has happened and what hasn't. I do believe people who come forward, 90% or more of the people I have uh, worked with who have claimed that they have been harassed in their workplaces, truly feel as though they were harassed. Ultimately, when we do the investigation, Sometimes we find that it was harassment and sometimes we find it wasn't. Their feelings are real, but the facts sometimes tell a different story. And it's very important to be true to the facts while still acknowledging and appreciating the very, very difficult feelings that people come forward with and the reality uh, of their uh, perception. Shall we move on to the case study, Rabbi, or do you want to add a few things? No, I, I just want to pause for a minute and see if there are any questions that anybody has before we move to the next step. So if there's any either clarifying questions that you have, take a minute and you can type it into the chat. All right, we'll keep going with the case study, but if you, oh, how do you prohibit? Okay, here we go. How do you prohibit retaliation when you don't have power over your congregants? How can rabbis report when a congregant is, ha is harassing them? Hey, Fran. Um, the protection against retaliation comes when acts that appear to be retaliatory are addressed in some way and stopped. So uh, if, if one does not have the authority or capacity to address it, then then it's a, a process of figuring out who does have that authority and how that can be done. Um, I, I, that's the best answer I can give you without a context for the question. And then what was the second one? How can rabbis report when a congregant is harassing them? I think that's where your board comes in. Um, this is where governance comes in. It is absolutely essential to me that rabbis understand that they are entitled to a harassment-free environment and that when harassment is permitted to happen um, because people feel entitled with their rabbis sometimes or they, they break down boundaries because they feel that there's a special relationship, that the rabbi needs the support of their governments to set firm boundaries and create organizational help. And the approach does not need to be with 21 guns coming at the congregant. It may be uh, one leader sitting down with the congregant and having a conversation and making it clear that this behavior, whether it's an intentional or inadvertent, that it is not helpful to the community and that they need to find alternative ways to relate. If it becomes more serious than that, then there needs to be an investigation commissioned by your board. And that investigation needs to be taken very seriously. I think that one way to preempt this, and look, we all know this is so much easier said than done, that this is theoretical and philosophical, but when push to co comes to shove, it is very challenging. But what this Me Too movement has given us the opportunity to do is to be proactive in talking about what values do we affirm and what policies we need to be in place. So the fact that over 100 people have signed up to be on this call um, can give all of us the strength, should give us the strength to begin to talk to our lay leaders. And I think in many ways, never talk to just one person at a time. I think this is an opportunity where you would speak to your president and executive vice president um, together so that there's two people hearing things or in an executive director and a lay leader, whatever, 
each structure is going to be different and talk about how we want to put this in place. I would personally suggest um, the distinction between, oh, I just lost my train of thought, um, th that if you open it up by talking about things that can happen at congregants, starting with that and harassment that they might feel, that then you're more apt to be able to then talk about harassment that you, that we ourselves as clergy feel and people will be less defensive. Um, but I think that this movement gives us an opportunity to be proactive, not reactive. Um, the, and I, the, I would just re reiterate, Rachel, but the, I think that the place you start with it is we want to ha have a vital congregation where everybody feels safe and respected and that they will, that they are treated fairly. So how do we get there and how do we keep things from getting derailed? I see another question here. Um, it says, what is the outcome of those 90% of cases that one believes the person that was harassed? Letting go of harasser, what if it's a lay leader at your synagogue that harasses you? What if that's, if that's your shul's president? And of course, this is all hypothetical. Uh, you know, the, the question of what happens when there is a finding that somebody was harassed is a, it's a multivalent question uh, because it depends. It depends on the severity of the harassment it depends how early it was reported. It depends on the history of the situation. Um, it depends on uh, the organization's capacity to retain or not retain people. So if you have a situation in which somebody was terribly harassed and they have, they're triggered into trauma every time they see the person who harassed them, there's no way those individuals can continue to coexist in the same organization. And there are times where organizations have to say to uh, somebody who's engaged in serious misconduct, we can't have you be part of this community because of the harm that's been done. There are also, um, there are also times where um, you have people who have a relationship and something goes wrong and uh, harassment happens, but there's a desire for some sort of restorative process to be able to allow both people to stay in the community and to, uh, and to try to uh, bring about healing, sometimes not just for the people involved, but for the community as a whole. So there are lots of options and remediation can be anything from a conversation to a written warning to telling somebody that until they get coaching or even therapy that they can't participate to making a decision that um, that this you just breached our trust so seriously that we can't continue. So that, Fran, you just answered the last question. Now there's the question, can you discuss the line between flirting and harassment? Sure. Um, the difference is welcomeness. Um, and and so it doesn't go to what is the behavior that is flirting and what is the behavior that is harassment. It goes to the degree of welcomeness. And of course, we can't, we don't all carry around like a red light and a green light. So somebody gives us a compliment and we put on a green light so they know they like it. Um, but there is an expectation, I think, that in the world today, and certainly within the context of a, uh, a synagogue, that one would develop acuity in picking up on people's nonverbal cues, their body language, the way they respond, um, and if something isn't reciprocated to understand that you discontinue it at this point, that if it, if it's, if it does not, if it is not met with a smile and a reciprocation, then it's probably misdirected. You know, I hear from people, you know, you just can't give people compliments anymore. And frankly, 30 years of doing this work, I've never seen anybody, uh, 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 investigated for telling somebody they like some, their shoes or their tie. Uh, I think when we get into flirting, it's a matter of incremental approaches towards somebody to express interest in them, finding that reciprocity and not pursuing things at a level beyond that reciprocity. So you're not, you're not getting explicit. You're not, uh, you're not pursuing them. You're not hounding them. You're not um, you're not inundating them with communication, but you're having essentially a dance between two human beings that's welcome and enjoyable. Okay, let's move to the case study. Sorry, this out loud. <laughs>
Uh, Renee, a relatively new congregant, approaches the rabbi. She reports that David, a long-standing congregant who is a former board member and active on a number of committees, recently pulled her aside during an oneg to, quote, belatedly welcome her and her family to the congregation. She states he put his arm around her in a way that caused his hand to brush her breast, and then, while continuing to talk about how delighted he was that Renee was a new member, gave her three kisses, each one more inappropriate than the next. She states she has been unable to sleep since the incident and wants David to be instructed to stay away from Renee and her family. So, go ahead. So there are a number of questions and concerns here. And since it's a Jewish webinar, I thought um, I would put this under four questions. So the first question is, um, in general, let's say, and somebody asked this before, what if David um, was repentant? What if we went to David and spoke to him, if that was what we wanted to do? Um, can he still be around or what does it mean to stay away? So what is the issue of what happens when someone's repentant? Where does the responsibility lie? The second question is the importance of fact finding um, versus safety. We want to protect somebody if they feel unsafe, and yet what is the due diligence that we must go through to um, work on finding out the facts? As Fran said, um, everybody um, can feel a certain way, but how we understand those facts might be different, and to whom do we owe a duty to get perspective? Um, that's certainly a challenge. The third is, how do we avoid writing off what somebody would call old school behavior and the tendency to protect leaders? And I think underlying a number of the questions that have already arisen today um, is the issue that it could often be the shul president or the shul past, <coughs> excuse me, the shul past president. And, and how do we deal with this? How do we not just write it off as old school behavior? And then what's the balance between minimizing somebody's feelings and overreacting to them? How do we understand both? Um, so I think those are some of the questions that emerge from this. So let's start by first saying that anytime come, somebody comes to you with a concern that might be some sort of misconduct, they're describing behavior that shouldn't be happening in your organization, the first thing to do, of course, is listen. And that, especially when I'm talking to rabbis, that might seem insanely obvious, but I find that even very skilled listeners hear about something like this and they wanna immediately dive into 100 questions about what happened, where it was, when it was, uh, and this is precisely the wrong thing to do. Individuals need to be able to tell you their story, and the best thing to do is to tell them they've done the right thing, to thank them for trusting you and coming to you, to acknowledge the feelings to the degree that they show you their feelings, and to let them know that um, if behavior like this is taken very seriously, and, um, and that uh, if this is happening, it shouldn't be happening. And rather than focusing on what Renee's desired outcome is, which can be problematic, because if she says, I want him kicked out of the synagogue, then anything short of that is going to be a problem. The focus should be on, if you're feeling uncomfortable, we need to fix that. If somebody's behaving in a way that they shouldn't be behaving, we need to stop it. So make sure Renee truly feels that she's had a chance to tell her story to describe the effect it's having on her, that she knows that you're grateful she brought it forward, and then give her a timeline on when she will hear something back. And I generally would recommend within the first 24 hours. That doesn't mean the situation's gonna be fixed in 24 hours, but within 24 hours, there'll be a game plan for addressing this. The next thing that needs to happen is the game plan. Someone is going to need to look into this and certainly at least talk with David and find out what his perspective is on what happened. That should be a fairly structured conversation and maybe even a conversation with two people so that one person is taking notes and the other person is asking. And the first thing would be to ask David an open-ended question about, you know, we've had a concern raised by one of our congregants about your interaction with her 
can you think of anything that may have led to a complaint? And then if he says, I have no idea, then you're going to have to ask him about his interaction with Brene and have him describe very specifically the way he recalls that interaction. Now, depending on his response, which could be, you know, I had a little too much wine at the own egg and I, the next day was so sorry and I was, I feel terrible and can I apologize to her? Or maybe I have no idea what she's talking about. You know, she's making this up. The, the next step is going to be to figure out how do you get to that promise you have made that if this has happened, it will stop. And uh, what are you going to do to create for Renee a sense of uh, safety in the congregation while also giving David the fairness that he deserves? So based on what you hear, the response may be, this was really problematic. He's not repentant. It's not going to be fixed. Can we continue to have these people in our congregation with an expectation that they have no contact or would that be too disruptive? Or can they, is David amenable to coaching and uh, says that even though I don't think I did it, I will never, I will never touch her again. I will, uh, I will be uh, uh, cordial, but I won't, I won't try and be her friend. Uh, or um, do you go towards a restorative process if David is truly repentant? So you have lots of options, but the most important part is that the situation changes, safety, fairness, and respect are restored. Bye bye. No, I, I, one second. I'm making notes for myself. Um, so I, I think again, what Fran has set up is is a case study and some responses that help that work in the best case scenario. That David's open to hearing it. Um, that Renee might be open to hearing something restorative. We're not sure. We know that, like in if you're playing any instrument, you know sometimes you have to go off script in terms of the notes, and there's different flourishes. Some that work for the positive, and sometimes things don't work. And what's hard about this entire presentation, and I want to acknowledge that, is that it's a, it's not one size fits all, but how do we open up a, how do we create a environment where these conversations are allowed? And these conversations not are encouraged because you don't want to encourage something if things aren't happening badly, but for, encourage them if there is a problem. So we need to think about how to do that. Are there any questions so far on the case study? And let me, um, if I might just step in, because I, the, the current environment is actually providing a wonderful opportunity to have these discussions. I just had to sit down with a physician who is um, generally beloved, but he's an old school sort of grossly sexist individual. People feel great affection towards him. They view him as a brilliant healer. He's got a sort of paternalistic attitude that uh, I shouldn't say the term, but he's sort of fatherly and people really like that. He's an older guy, but he just keeps saying and doing things that are, have gone past boneheaded and into hurtful to people. And I found that the context of the current dialogue was a great way to start a conversation with him. I said, doctor, you know, there's really been a huge amount of attention to the importance of women feeling, uh, that they're able to be fully present and fully respected and fully valued in the workplace. And I need to tell you that I don't think you're trying to do it, but some of the things you've been saying and doing are making the women professionals who I think you really care about feel diminished and, and, um, and as though they can't be as successful as the men. I know you would never want to do that. So are you willing to take some feedback? And then because he, you know, he said, oh, yeah, I've been reading about this Me Too thing, it was a way to put it in a current context. And it was a really rich, wonderful discussion. Not entirely sure we're done, but it was a start. Now, Fran, I, I know we didn't discuss this in advance, but I love your thought just as someone who's not only facilitating this with you, but listening to what you're saying. When having these conversations with the doctor or with David, who might you suggest be the person to have that conversation, if it, it should it be somebody of the same gender, should it be somebody of a different gender, of the other gender, um, what might you suggest? 
Should it be the rabbi regardless of gender? You know, I would, I think if I could, you know, make my ideal situation, it would be a man and a woman. So maybe the rabbi and a board president or a, board, a lay leader, uh, so that this, this comes across as not a gendered discussion, but a human discussion. Um, and and uh, is about, it, it always has to be steered towards, we want you to be the most effective person you can be. We want you to be uh, doing the best job you can do. We want you to be effective in how you treat people. So and I see I, the question that's, the question just came up, is that sometimes uh, men who feel abused or harassed, and absolutely, and we haven't even talked about uh, people who are not gender binary, often are the subject of harassment in our, in our uh, uh, workplaces and congregations as well. So although we have been talking from uh, the model of a male harasser and a woman uh, recipient, uh, it is not a respecter of any of those things. And, but in fact, for the first several slides that Fran showed in terms of the issues of abuse and harassment, none of those need to be um, focused just on one gender to the other. We know that there can be issues amongst employees, um, ha issues of power differential, and what employees are uh, legally have the right to deserve um, a safe harassment-free environment is something that crosses the board no matter what. Um, and I think that that's why I, I like what Fran said, that we should always have, if we can, two people in the conversation. Um, okay, so let's see, here's the next step. What's the next step if David totally denies the incident? Well, then we do what's called a credibility assessment. Have there been similar complaints about David in the past? Is this behavior consistent what, with what we know of David. David's been around, he's been a lay leader, he's been active. Um, so there has to be some sort of thing saying, you know, we've always known that David does this, or this is so unlike him, we find it very difficult to believe. And then, so the conclusion is, you know, maybe this was, this was a misperception or David is denying it and we don't have any reason not to believe him, but we also believe Renee. So can we say to David, David, okay, if this never happened, that's great. Can we ask that you be particularly mindful in any dealings you have with Renee? And can we ask that you refrain from actually seeking her out? And then we go back to Renee and we don't have to say we weren't able to make a determination. What we say is we are quite certain that you will not have any further experience of this kind with David. And if you do, our response will be quick and it will be um, much more aggressive than it's been. I, I so you sure her that she'll be safe. What's important is what's important is that Renee feels heard, that she was listened to. It doesn't mean that the step um, nobody can predict exactly what the next step is. Um, Dassey, I'm glad I, I'm feeling good that. Fran's answer to you was satisfactory. I think, again, in the moment, it could be very difficult to look at the Renee character in, in the face, but I think we need to be able to look ourselves in the mirror, feel like we've done what we can. It's hard to assess um, personality and credibility. Um, this is a art, not a science, which makes it extraordinarily difficult. Um, but that's why starting from the get-go of what what's the what are the values of our community and how do we talk about them so we only have a few minutes left i want to think about what are some of the big picture issues um and how might we talk about this and then what i'd like people to do um it ideally is send in your thoughts it could still be on the chat or it can be after the fact where are you doing well where do you feel your organizations are successfully training people, if there's examples of good policies that you've set out, um, we'd love to see that and share that with others. So here are a few suggestions of how you might um, deal with this from a cultural, at a cultural moment. Number one, we can certainly use the power of the BIMA. What does it mean to give a sermon about this? Um, admittedly, I think it's sometimes harder for women to talk about this than men. Um, because women feel that if women talk about this, then people will say, well, she's only talking about this because she's a woman. Um, 
and, and that is a challenge, um, one which I don't think there is a good answer to, but if we can put it into a larger context, it's important. I taught last week, this has nothing to do with Me Too, but I gave a sermon about our president's comments regarding other countries. While people know how I feel personally, I certainly made sure to include the Kasich Bush op-ed to show that this is not a partisan issue, this is a human issue. And so I think that if we're going to present issues that seem to be about gender and they are women's issues, that having male voices um, as part of our sermons um, is, uh, is a way to buffer that. Is it sad to me that women need to use men's voices to promote their own? Yes. But if our goal is to communicate a message, then we need to figure out how to do so in a way that people will listen. Second, I think we should be talking about this at board meetings. I think we should be writing about this in our bulletin, but in a way that communicates what we affirm, not what we're trying to catch. I always say to you know, kids, let's catch you do, doing something right. So how do we work to affirm a great environment and what happens when we don't? So there's a number of ways we can do this, but it's going to take partnerships with our lay leaders. Hopefully we will have people on board. And that might mean some um, behind the scenes uh, politicking. We all know that that goes into this as well. So who will our allies be at different meetings? Um, how do we make sure to set that up so that we don't feel like we are a lone voice? Um, that takes time. It's not going to happen overnight and it takes trust. And I'd just like to add that I think that boards are notoriously uh, under-informed about their obligations in this area. They do have legal, I mean, they all have carried liability insurance, but they, they do have personal liability if they fail to ensure that these things are being handled right. So training for boards is not a bad idea at all. Any other, okay, let's see, we have a question. If a harassment claim is verified, what obligation does the congregation have to inform other Jewish organizations that the harasser is involved within a particular community? So this is where we have a number of different streams to follow because um, there is a risk of being called defamatory if one shares information across other organizations. But uh, morally and ethically, sometimes there's a desire to share that information. This is where you really need to work with your legal counsel to be sure that uh, when you are doing the right thing, you are also doing the legally correct thing. And it will vary from situation to situation. So this brings us to the conclusion of the webinar. Are there any last questions that people would want to raise? Wait, hold on. Sorry, this is a long one. So many people kind of limited in our engagement conduct. Okay, Ariel, that was a very long question. I need to figure out how to, um, but, um, Ariel Rickman, can you put Ariel Hanyan on to have her articulate it in a way that is more bite-sized because I want to be able to address it, but I'm having a problem processing it so quickly. Can you hear me? I think I've been unmuted. Yep, you're good. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. So the case study is beautiful. I think and, and I appreciate how you have to limit what we're covering today. What I'm feeling is um, the, the sort of pressing awareness that has been not dealt with um, in a formal way, let's say, in the rabbinical assembly or in conversations that have been supported among women colleagues, even though we've been talking about it. And anecdotally, there's been lots of me too around abuse or harassment and discrimination, that entire spectrum, even to assault, of women rabbis. And so the question that I wanna plant, even if we can't address it today, mm -hmm. is 
about when it's the rabbi, the woman rabbi, who is experiencing abuse or harassment, not with a normative, well-trained, supportive board behind her and we're dealing with a congregant, but when the problem is actually the board um, or a member on the board because of institutional power dynamics, because we haven't set up a framework in the movement to address this, because there are many women colleagues who are who have received clearance to work in non-movement synagogues because there are so many synagogues that are not open to women rabbis that are part of uh, USCJ that it's important to, so it's sometimes essential for women to be more open to other congregations. Um, and also maybe Fran, if you could just comment on the ministerial exception, because even where things are clearly illegal, it's not clear that there's anyone to enforce the law on behalf of women rabbis. So maybe that's an entire follow-up phone call, but I just want to flag it as a, as a concern. So I want Fran to sort of take the final words because I think that this issue of how we respond legally and procedurally is really important. I mean, the answer of course is yes. I mean, that this is, we know it's, and how we change generations of culture to be more affirming of and respectful of female colleagues um, is way beyond the Me Too movement. That has become the catchphrase, but I think that it's something that we need to expand. I don't know if it's, th the problem is talking amongst ourselves at the rabbinical assembly or whatever our governing organization of rabbis is, isn't as helpful as how do we have joint conversations between representatives of USCJ and representatives of the RA? How do we convene a task force with Julie Schoenfeld and Steve Wernicke for using the conservative movement as an example? I, I don't know, I'm just thinking out loud, but I know that when we talk amongst ourselves, you're absolutely right, that we affirm what we know, but we don't move the conversation forward. I think it's similar to how rabbis get leadership training. Um, there are so many opportunities for us to get um, leadership training, and yet, that leadership training is often in a vacuum where lay leaders aren't present. So we're being taught new skills, but how you translate those skills, if the lay leaders haven't been trained to hear those new skills, then we're dead in the water on arrival. Um, but that's not their fault. It's systemic. And so how do I, I don't know the answer, but we need to think about it. All right, Fran, take the, the, since we end in just two minutes. Um, let's yeah. Finish up. yeah, number one, just in response to this, uh, this overall question, sometimes it really does take a centralized repository, someone who has some capacity to intervene, and that external resource, particularly for these very isolated rabbis, is essential. Um, ministerial exemption, there's been a lot of misreportage about ministerial exemption that said, and there was a headline in a publication that said, rabbis cannot sue for sexual harassment. That is incorrect. Um, the ministerial exemption um, applies to a variety of different reasons that, that individuals can't sue, but it does not provide sanctuary to harassers. Uh, and so, so um, there, and there are circumstances where it would apply and many circumstances where it would not. So it is important to be well advised. But let me also say that whether or not a rabbi could actually prevail in a lawsuit over behavior is less the point than the behavior that's happening in the first place. Um, that you know, the idea would be that something um, far short of a lawsuit should be able to intervene in and stop that behavior before the before the legal question arises. So I don't mean to minimize it, and I do think lawsuits are ultimately uh, the way that some cultures have to change. Um, but do not assume a ministerial exemption it would exempt you from bringing a claim. So this brings us to two o'clock. I want to thank Fran for being a partner and helping put this together. There's no way that I could have presented on this by myself. And I'm humbled to and be thank you. all of you um, to be doing this. I think we still have a long way to go, but it really is wonderful to see so many people interested in this. And um, the organizers and I will figure out what are next step of materials that you should receive that can be help uh, for your toolbox in terms of working with your board and otherwise. If there are things that in particular you think you're doing well, I'm going to give you my email address um, so you can write this down. It's rabbiain, A-I-N, at 
SPSNYC.org. So Rabbi Ain at Sutton Place Synagogue, New York City.org. Um, send me an email with what's, what you're doing well, and we're going to compile this. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Jamie.